going over real quick is just a simple video going over loops. It is going to be the only video I do on loops just because they're honestly really straightforward. There's just a few of them and most of the actual logic that's going to happen here is in the previous videos dealing with conditional branching because the law of what's going on is based on relational data so most of the complex parts here have already been covered this is just a new construct to kind of get you familiar with it they're very very common so they're not useless in whatsoever there will be a follow-up programming video that's also pretty short but fairly detailed so let's go and take a look at the actual content and get started all right just basic loops and let's take a look real quick there we go so what are they so often when we do a lot of programming we're going to want to execute a block of code many times over so maybe we don't know how many times we want to do it so we want to do an infinite amount until it meets some condition or maybe we want to do it a finite number of times and we can do this very simply by using a few different types of loop constructs which are just going to execute that body of code however many times that we want it to be executed so before we look into loops themselves let's go ahead and set up the idea of what variable scope is so this is essentially how you set a variable because during conditional branching it's important there but it's very important in loops because there's going to be larger blocks of code that happen almost like their own section of a program so it's likely that you might try to create a variable inside of a loop inside one of these blocks and it will not be in the scope of your program once you exit the loop so we're looking at block scope essentially so it's gonna be anything that's bound by these curly braces this includes the if else statements from previous chapters and then the loops we're going to go over in just a bit the functions like our main function we've been using so much also follow some roles so anything you establish in the main function or whatever function that you're actually using is going to be bound by the first set of parentheses not parentheses uh braces that are in it so if you create an integer here well any if statement if else statement switch statement loop that you make inside the main function it's going to have access to it because it's going to be in scope however if i were to do a if statement here and i create an integer here and i try to access it once that integer block is done i'm not going to have access to it so what i have to do is find the integer i need to create it before and then use it when it's in here so the initialization of your variables is going to be very very critical dealing with variable scope so that's what you're going to notice me constantly make variables before i actually need them because if i need them beyond so let's say i create a variable in the main function i use it in an if else statement or my loop that's usually because that variable needs to continue to exist in my scope once I'm done with that if statement or that, that loop. So that's where variable scope comes to play. Very, very important that you initialize your variables in the appropriate places. So with all that being said, let's take a look, I'll look at the first loop, which is just going to be a simple while loop. So they're also referred to as conditional loops because they're gonna to continue to loop until they meet a certain condition often used in conjunction with scanning user input but not always so here we have an integer named repeat num equals zero so while repeat num for modulo two is equal to zero we're going to do printf you are in an infinite loop and printf enter an odd number to escape so we have a value here going into the loop so this is in the my main function scope inside the while loop has an entirely different scope but we're not really initializing anything here so it's not a big deal so we have it set to zero which will meet this condition so it's going to continue to loop because it's going to continue to be true so we do print f you are infinite loop so if we continue to put even numbers in here this is going to continue to loop over and over and over again however we use an odd number this condition will not be true anymore 
therefore it'll escape. So user just scans numbers until we put in an odd number and all of a sudden we're outside the loop. Good to go. And that's basically while loops. It's a very, very simple example here. You'll see more complex examples throughout your time coding. But for now, it just loops until you meet a particular condition. So, we have an alteration of the while loop known as a do while loop. These, you generally won't see as frequently because everything that you do can be done via basic while loops. However, they have one very, very helpful aspect and that they will always execute at least once. So you see them very frequently in menus because this, we just have an initialized character. It's not set to anything. In the previous one, we had to set the variable in order to access the loop. It had to meet the criteria of that loop to start it. If it had been odd number, that loop wouldn't have executed because it wouldn't have met the condition. However, when we do a do while loop, then it is going to do the body of the loop at least once and then it'll check the condition and determine if it needs to continue to loop so here we have an uninitialized character print f please enter a letter the user will then enter a character and then while the character is not a letter we're using a uh, new library of c type and it's just a character library it's not a lot going on it just gives us access to some character functions and this one that's determining hey is this actually a letter that you put in or was it a number was it maybe um, a question mark if it's any of those non alpha like alphabet style characters like the uppercase letters lowercase letters would be fine then if it's not that we're going to continue to loop until you do put one in because whenever you do put one in we're going to actually break out a loop and then it's going to print whatever letter you had so your letter is maybe i'll put in f and then it'll print out f not a big deal but the real good thing here is that your do while loop is going to execute the body code at least once guaranteed that's very helpful for menus. So, whenever I do the follow-up video for doing some code on this, you'll notice I use a few do while loops there. And then the last unique loop type that we have is a for loop. So very often, we're going to want to execute a particular block of code a set number of times. We can do that very easily with for loops. They're very similar to summation notation, if you're familiar with that in mathematics. These loops are often called counting loops for that same reason of their iterative nature. So, here we have an integer of user input. So please enter a number. We're going to fill in that integer there. And then we have something very important here. So, obviously, user input is in the scope. Then we have for loop here, which creates its own scope within these curly braces. However, this I right here, this int i equals zero, semicolon, a condition, semicolon, an operation. This is the nature of a for loop. We have any initialized variables that we want at the start of the loop before the first semicolon. The condition the loop needs to exit for the second parameter and then we have another semicolon and then finally we have operations going to happen on each iteration so this style that you see int i equals zero some condition i plus plus is just the quintessential style of for loops that you'll see all the time we initialize our counter which is our i which is usually index i is less than or equal to in this case, whatever we input, and then we do I plus plus to increment that value. So we're counting up. We count from zero up to user input. Once I equals user input, we will then break out a loop. So it's gonna say this is iteration zero, one, two, three. If I put in 17, it would print that out zero through 17 times, break out a loop, and then we're done. 
counts the number of times that we execute. Now, this could be i equals i plus 5, and then it jumps up 0 to 5 to 10 to 15, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways that we can alter the for loop's nature to fit our needs. So if you ever want to count just the even numbers, you would do i equals i plus 2 instead. So you have 0, 2, 4, 6, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that we can do. But, I want to point out here, int i equals 0. This i, this variable i, only exists inside this for loop. If I try to access it here, once the loop is done, it's gone. It's not in the scope. I don't have access to it. it. Will not work. If you want to have access to the counter, you would need to initialize it before the for loop. That's fine. Happens pretty frequently. But again, just be mindful of the variable scope where you initialize your variables. And just, just be mindful of something. Now, we're going to see very, very frequently as well is the idea of nested loops. So, nested loops is exactly what it sounds like. You nest a loop within another loop. Now, this, these are very easy to get carried away with because as you run this loop, it's gonna run, if you, if you have a loop, it's gonna run 10 times here. And you have this outer loop also running 10 times. Well, congratulations, you now have 100 iterations, 10 times per loop here. So 10, 20, 30, 40. So very, very simple code, but a lot of execution. So this one, you also be very mindful to not absolutely destroy your program's performance by doing too many iterations. You have to be very careful here because again, it can be easy to lose track of what you're doing in these loops so optimization and being aware of what's going on inside of your loops is very very important here and that's not to say that nested loops are bad you shouldn't stray away from them they have a lot of use cases and they're very helpful in a lot of times but you know if you're doing a while loop inside of a for loop instead of another while loop you you might have gone you might have gone wrong somewhere. So again, just be self-aware of what's going on in your code because it can have detrimental performance and you might not notice it off the hand. But let's take a look at this code first. We have int square size equals zero. So we have an integer square size. That's gonna be the size of a side, the length, the height, etc. etc. Please enter a number. So I'm gonna do say Let's just do two. So then it's going to for int i equals zero. We initialize i. Then i is less than square size two. I plus plus. We're going to initialize j inside this nested for loop. Square size is still two. J plus plus. Front f a hash symbol and a space. And then after that loop, we print out a new line character. So let's take a look at that. So. And I go zero, we start this loop right here. And immediately start in this loop. So I go zero, J go zero. So J zero or to just print this out. Okay. I now have a hash symbol and a space. And I loop back up. J plus plus. So now J is one. One is less than two print this out again and then we loop back I have J plus plus two this is not true this now breaks the condition so we are done with this loop and then we print a new line character and then we loop this back now I plus plus I is one and then we restart this loop, which is going to do the exact same thing again. So, percent slash percent slash not slash uh, underscore, and then it'll exit that new line character. 
repeat this. I plus plus two. This now breaks. We execute past here, and we're done. So what we have at the end of the day is a two by two block of S symbols. Now, if I change this to three or four, then if I did three, you would notice something like this. And this is gonna be very, very similar to what I do in the next video. It's gonna be a much, much more complex version of this exact code. So, that's nested loops. They can do some pretty, pretty phenomenal things. But again, it's just one of the things that if it gets out of hand, it can be very hard to debug these and to maintain them. So, just be mindful as you're creating them. Moving on, lastly, we have the common loop uses, which I've already kind of talked on a bit, but there's gonna be two loops in this particular code that again are gonna be kind of precursors to what I do in the next video. But I digress. It's quite common to use while loops to ensure proper data input. So you see them used very frequently with menus. And then for for loops, it's very, very common to use them during mathematical calculations. Very similar to the previous slide where I was using for loops to print out a square based on the number of sides or the length of the sides. Here, I have a while loop followed by a for loop. The while loop is taking in user input. Again, I have a negative one here as some preset input to get into the while loop. Notice my condition is user input is less than zero or user input is greater than 62. So what this is saying is I need an input between zero and 62. So if negative one goes in, well, that is not true for this condition or this condition. So both equate to zero, zero over zero is zero. So I execute the body of the loop. Now if I put in 54, that is greater than, it's not less than, still gonna continue to loop this until I put in maybe 15. Actually, three, let's just do three. And that is user input is less than zero. Is less than zero. User input, I'm so sorry. When I said negative one. Negative one, this executes one or zero. This gives us one, so while one, this is true, it's gonna to continue to loop, my bad. It needs to be false, so we're gonna put in three. Three is not less than zero, false. Three is not greater than 62, false. So now this no longer equates to one, so now we'll exit out with our user input set to three, okay. So, once we have that value, because we use a while loop to guarantee that the input data was going to be proper for the next function here, I am doing hours, so that's why I have the math library up here. We're doing the power function, two to the i. So we're counting powers of two. Starting at zero, doing i plus plus, i is less than or equal to user input. So two to the current index equals assuming a long data type so the power function type cast a log so first one is going to be 2 to the 0 equals 1 and 2 to the 1 equals 2 and 2 equals 4 and finally, two to the three equals eight. And if I continued on, maybe I put in five. I get two to the four, 16, two to the five, 32, and I can go up to 62, and then it'll continue to print out. That's gonna be a very large number. That is why it has a cutoff around 62, because we can't really calculate a static number that large in these data types so you have to do some tricky manipulation to get that so that's why this 
range here exist and negative values no, I didn't really want to deal with negative values so I said hey I want to make sure that I have non-negative values in a range that I can actually properly calculate easily so I inserted the data type using this while loop and then use a for loop to actually execute it that number of times so now I have 2 to 5 or 2 and track all the numbers if I'm going to do something like this Fibonacci sequence I could do that it wouldn't be too bad so that is pretty much everything I have for loops. It's not a lot, it's not super difficult, there's a few things to keep track of and use cases to keep track of along with a little bit of syntax again to keep track of just because there is a lot that you can do with loops and they have a lot of functionality but the actual setting up of them and using them isn't that I guess, clever. It's not very complex. They're pretty straightforward. You do a while loop, you go into make condition, you're done. And for loop, you do it a number of times, to a degree, into make condition, and you're done. Do while loop, you do it at least once, and then continue on like a regular while loop, and also done. So, mostly with loops, it's understanding the syntax, especially for loops, and then manipulating the nature of them to suit your needs and also again nested loops just be careful with them because they can get out of hand pretty quick but overall it shouldn't be too bad so at the end of the day i hope this is helpful hope you learned something i'll see you next video